We have this coolest thing at the ASPCA, and I, what's that called where you get all of the photos? Widen. Widen. And so every time that we have an event and our photographers come out, they cache all of their photographs in one spot. And it was really fun going through and, and stealing photos or, and then adding some of the ones that we had as well. So uh, I just basically made a whole bunch of stories out of these photos, so I hope you'll enjoy it. Well, uh, 2018 was a banner year. For those of you that um, are not in the disaster business, you might not have appreciated just how busy we were. When I first got into the field, we were averaging about five, six, seven, eight. I think one year in the early 2000s, we had nine. Um, so anytime you can get above $10 billion disasters in a year, that's huge. And matter of fact, it used to be that we would get 10 worldwide. And so any time that you can get this many, um, especially, you know, at first we thought it was going to be around 14 and then maybe 15. And uh, some people, depending upon how they do the calculations, are actually looking at 18. Uh, that's a large number of billion-dollar disasters. And we won't have that final figure quite yet. Uh, so it's been a, a very impressive. And you can see it ranged from everything from, and most of them we were at, which was convenient, uh, a couple of hurricanes on the coast, of course, and uh, tornadoes and drought conditions, of course. That's a tough one to respond to. I've only done a couple of those because what are, what are you going to do? You can't just bring in a whole bunch of water because you can't sustain that. So those were always a little bit tough. So a record year, a banner year for sure, uh, of extremes. $14 billion officially right now, $14 billion uh, events in 2018, which was a huge year. Uh, but what's most impressive is when you map those out and look at the trends on what is happening. For those of you that are going to the NACEP Summit, I'll be doing a talk on global climate change and the impact that we're seeing on, on various species. I hope you'll come and listen to that. Uh, but it's really based upon this phenomena that we're seeing right now, that we are getting more disasters that are bigger, impacting more people. And if more people have more animals, then we're going to have a greater impact on animals as well. And for us, it was a busy year. Uh, Any time that we're getting above, we usually average between three to five, maybe sometimes five to seven. Uh, so when we're getting, as I mentioned, 10 officially, nine that we actually got out on the door, that's a pretty big year. And what I want to do is talk about each one of these, exception of the Wolseley Fire. Um, I'm going to talk about each one of these and then oh, and the New York City explosion. We won't talk about that. And really the purpose of that is to maybe you'll get some little nugget out of something that either went well for us or didn't go so well, and maybe you can take that home. So. That's my goal, anyway, is to present these out there, and maybe you'll say, oh, I've got to remember to do that when we get home. So getting back to the billion dollar, uh, number of billion dollar disasters, and you look at the colorful ones that are above the mean, which is the solid black line. I'll see if I can get this to work. So here's the mean, if you can see it. Oh, there it is over there. And then these, if you look at, that's 2012 uh, through 2017 and 18. We are, in some cases, twice the number of billion-dollar disasters that we've been in the past. So impressive numbers for sure. And when you look at what type of disasters we have, that also is changing. We are seeing a uh, non-linear increase in the number of floods and fires worldwide. And in the United States, we are seeing a non-linear increase in the number of fires. And so what we'll try to show on this conversation in December at the summit is how does that relate to global climate change? And why would that possibly be adding, if you'll excuse the pun, the fuel to the fire? But if you look at worldwide now and you look at the number of billion dollar disasters, you can see that windstorms uh, and, and floods are the biggies. And when you look at the United States, 75% of our presidentially declared disasters are floods. That's a huge number. So if you're thinking about what am I going to do when I get home in terms of training, I have an idea for you. You might want to think about slack water rescue, right? Because that's what we get the most calls for today. And the wind events, which was number two worldwide, 
they typically lead to flood events as well. So Barry is going to be a wet event. We're not going to be going land search and rescue in Barry if we go. We're going to be doing water rescue. So that kind of falls into that whole theme of what we are seeing the most of right now. And if you look at it in the United States, you'll see that people just assume that we're spending most of our time in the coastal communities. But if you look at the presidentially declared disasters, we're inland. Two weeks ago, we were in Arkansas. Nebraska had historic flooding. The uh, Mississippi River has been at significant flood stage for the longest period of time since uh, 1912. So that's a, a surprising statistic right up there. Instead of really thinking about all of these events that we're doing and all the trains we're doing along the coast, we should be moving up toward the Mississippi and Ohio river basins. So what I did is I put all of these things together and then threw in a bunch of cool slides. So I'll get a lot of that reaction, I hope. Aw, show that one again. A little piglet uh, during the fires. Pretty cool show. Well, let's start with the uh, mudslides in Santa Barbara. I didn't realize it, but Mendocino County is the richest area code in the United States. A lot of famous movie people live there, a lot of personalities. Uh, Oprah, we, you turned around in Oprah's house. Uh, I got to turn around at Oprah's property. Um, what's the Ellen DeGeneres? She just sold her place to Ryan Seacrest. Who else did we see while we were there? I don't know this stuff normally, but Rob Lowe what came out, yeah. Jeff Bridges. There were a lot of folks that got involved with this response that lived right there. Uh, and so every home you would go into, well, every other home would be this amazing place. And Joe was talking about one place that we went where the guy had bought side-by-side -side lots and put probably a $3,000 or 3,000 square foot containment area for his flamingos. They were absolutely gorgeous. And koi ponds everywhere. And then this. So what had happened is that the Thomas fire came last December, burned about a quarter of a million acres, and of course left the hillside barren. Now you get all of this torrential rain that came down, and the mountain just came right into the city, right into the town, and just brought it down. And it was a wall of force that was absolutely amazing. I showed you the picture from the tsunami. This is very similar to it, not quite the elevation, but this car was carried halfway down the mountain and ended up in this guy's house. And the, you know, you're probably looking at six to eight feet of mud that accumulated against these homes. All of these places were just raised. There was no way that they were going to salvage them. So they just brought in great big front end loaders and started to tear it up. Well, one thing that you're going to see through all of the six, seven or that I'm going to talk about is the need for collaboration. You know, the fun part about our job, and I know these guys would agree, is when we come and help one of your communities and we get along. It's just so much more fun for us when there's that relationship established and we're working with you, alongside you, other than you know, maybe as a track out here somewhere. Uh, and I'm, I would encourage you, as you're thinking about your MOUs in your county, and you're thinking about what group you want to establish, and we can help you find the perfect group for you, but think about the group that you want to work with, that you would enjoy, if you could enjoy such a thing, doing this kind of work. And all the groups are a little bit different. Uh, we've got some groups that are pretty aggressive. We've got some groups that are laid back. We've got some groups that only do large animal rescue. We've got other groups that only do sheltering. Uh, so of that group that I showed you, that National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition, there is a group that will fit for your community, I promise. But this is what you want to have. And this is what we had there. I mean, we just had a good time with these folks. and they. And what we did is that we took one of our people and we put them with an animal control officer and used an animal control unit. So we paired them up. So we could get some, some of their experience, they could get some of ours, and it worked extremely well. So you'll see that theme through a lot of them, through a lot of these presentations. The other one is the importance of credentialing. The very first thing we did when we got into town is we went over to emergency management, went to the EOC, and we signed in. And they then had us as official volunteers 
We were given our little credentials. Some of us were, some weren't. And that credential and the placard was sitting on every one of the vehicles that we took out. That is critical. Same thing we did in Arkansas. A couple of weeks ago, the very thing I did is went over to emergency management. I got my credential that said what we were doing, which in that time was animal search and rescue. And then every one of our vehicles got a placard that could go into the dash. So if you haven't done that yet, think about it. And I would recommend you get those magnetic placards that go right on, unless it's a brand new Ford that doesn't have any <laughs> metal in them. I think they're all plastic or whatever. But. So this was really amazing for us to be able to get through all the roadblocks and get up, roadblocks and get up there and get going. And, and what they were literally doing here is that they were having to take these boulders where the size of, they were bigger than homes, that came off that hill and they, they couldn't move them. So they had jackhammer crews up there breaking them up into chunks that they could get them down to a size that they could get them out of there. Well, I'm not sure what I'm doing on the left. That photo just <laughs> cracked me up. I had to put it in there. But uh, I spent a lot of time just looking for tracks. Because as, especially when we'd come and we'd find a, uh, you know, a, a, some kind of housing, whether it be for birds, cats, dogs, whatever, and you, you know, that housing for the birds would be, a coop would be maybe 100 yards down from where it started. And the one thing you wanted to do is to find out whether the birds were still alive or not. So we were constantly looking for tracks in the mud. And it was funny to me how, you know, I'm, I live out in the boonies and live up on a mountain forever. And so we're kind of used to figuring out what animal goes with what tracks. But it was amazing to me how many of the first responders did not know how to read track. So it's something you might want to add to your curriculum. Here's Joe on the right and Lauren on the left. Uh, that stick became everyone's best friend. Uh, so you could figure out what was the next step going to be, and you didn't want to go down and end up in your knees. But mud was just amazing to trek through. I mentioned um, about the importance of that lily pad function or that field staging. Uh, we were a long ways away from the shelter to where we were doing our work. So once again, we set up field staging. We had an animal control or a van or somebody that would stage at a parking lot. When we were full, we would call him, and he would meet us, and we would transfer our load. So we could then just turn around and go right back in the field. So give that some thought, whether you call it lily pad or whether you called it field staging. It really doesn't make any difference, but I think it works very well. At least it does for us. Um, I think, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, I've, it's already a fog of what I said even two hours ago, but when we were doing the fires in uh, Sonoma, we got into the whole thing about saving the koi. Did I mention that already? You shouldn't have done this because now you've got to hear the story. You should have just done this. Um, we had already done the dogs. We had done the large animal. We had done the cats. Uh, we were starting the cat trapping program. And as we were going out doing our feeding in place, we were seeing a lot of koi ponds. This is in California. So the two things that Californians have in every yard is a chicken and a koi, right? <laughs> and so I asked the director if it would be OK if I put together a plan to start rescuing all the koi. And he said, yeah, I guess if you want to save the koi. But it was miserable for him because there was no power to the ponds. The ponds were full of ash, and they were dying. So we put together, I actually wrote a plan. I called it No Koi Left Behind. <laughs> and, and it worked really well. We actually got the animal control officers to come out. We would pump these. We'd first net all the koi we could get. We had separate tanks because you can't, you can't put them in the same tanks. Um, so we would have a separate tank for that particular pond. We would net as many as we could. And then I had a little pump. And we would drop the level because we didn't want to leave any koi behind, right? And we got every single one of them, and I think we did eight or nine ponds. And then we asked a local koi group to come in and set up commercial ponds, because I guess they show their koi all the time. And he set up five or six great big uh, tubs out in a warehouse for us, and we would come back and set our koi up in there. And we rescued them all, and they all got adopted. <laughs> so now we get to Santa Barbara, and they said, oh, you guys are the koi experts. <laughs> Well, you have to do it once in this field, and you become an expert, right? So anyway, then we got into all kinds of species. And I thought Joe had the best approach for rescuing these. You just put your hand out and say, here, birdie, birdie, birdie. 
Isn't that what you're doing? And did it work? No. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I see. And think about the trapping teams. You know, I think on every disaster, that's one thing that we, we seem to do a lot of. But I want to share a quick story with you that what you don't want to do, and that's what happened up in the um, campfire, where the, uh, the groups, the local groups, uh, the cat trapping groups, insisted on going back into this poor town that was devastated and trapping the cats. And in their mind, they were doing the right thing because they're, in their mind, they were saying that the habitat wasn't there to sustain the feral cat population. The problem is they had no plan on the back end. All they knew is they had to get in there and start trapping cats. Well, where do you think they ended up at? In Joe's shelter. And there is nothing more, in my humble opinion, inhumane than taking a feral cat from the field and putting it into a wire cage like this around all these other cats. So what we do, and, and you did not hear that here, and I'll shut the mic off, but what I prefer to do is if I'm doing a flood or if I'm doing something like a fire and I do trap that cat, I will take it back to the closest locale I can find and release it just because I do not want to put that poor cat in there. Now, we did have a few places that had colonies established, and that doesn't always work, uh, but when they would consistently go out without a plan on the back end simply to satisfy their need to do rescue, they just weren't thinking it out. So when you do get into a trapping program, please give it a lot of thought, because now you've got to really think about what you're going to do if you do trap a wild or a feral cat. Is that you, Joe? Yep. I don't know if you noticed, Joe, but what I tried to do on all my slides is pull you as far to the white and then drop you down, because it makes you look thinner. And once again, the, the final stage for every disaster we do is the ability to reunite. And this, uh, I don't see him around here. I don't know if he's here, but Remy. Uh, Remy on the right hand is, he is amazing at that job. And so what you really want to do is go out and find out, find that individual that is compassionate, that's driven, that really wants to, um, that has that skill for communicating with people. In Arkansas, a couple weeks ago, we had Marlon from Florida who did an amazing job. Uh, so that, 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 those people are really critical to your team in terms of making sure that every animal gets back home. Well, let's move on to my favorite, which is Kilauea on the big island of Hawaii. It's my favorite because it was so challenging, I think, from 2018. And that's what we were up against. That is not a river. That's a lava flow. So all of this area here was coming down. Um, I mean, when you flew over it every day, you could, it looked like a river. It was moving that fast. And it was eerie because it almost looked like it was moving backwards uphill. So, and as you flew over it, and of course, you know, when you're in a helicopter, you're not flying very high, you could feel the heat coming up from it even at that level. So it was, a, it was an amazingly um, frightening, um, exhilarating, challenging, and fun disaster. It was a very unique situation because there was a lot of strife. Anybody from the islands? Anybody from Hawaii? FEMA region 10, no, 9. Um, there was a lot of um, rift between the lead agency, which was Hawaii Humane, and the local rescue groups. And a lot of it was warranted, but a lot of it was because there was just bad communication between the groups. So when we got there, I was hearing it all from the rescue groups. ASPCA has come here. We're going to rescue all the animals. And we're going to bypass the Hawaii Humane Society. I said, we can't do that. That's the authority having jurisdiction. So I talked to the director. And I said, would you mind if we put together a community meeting? And those are always a little scary. Because now you're trying to put all of these people who have been fighting for years in one room and see what happens. We called extra security, so we were OK. But they did. They all came together and they all showed up. So we had representatives from the mayor's office. We had, um, uh, I don't know what the legislative body is, but we had a representative, kind of like a councilman. Uh, we had animal control. And we had almost every single animal welfare group on the island show up for that meeting. And we just laid it out there and said, OK, here's what we're going to have to do if we're going to make this happen. We're going to have to work together. And we may agree to disagree in places. And this is what their job is. And maybe they're not going to be able to change that. 
but we got to come together if we're going to make this happen. And everybody was okay. And after that, things went fairly well. But Joel, uh, who is now with another group in the ASPCA, but and you'll see him in the next slide, he was really worried about it. He said, Dick, what's going to happen if a riot starts? I said, ah, oh, we'll be okay. <laughs> no riot started. And there's Joel. We miss him. He's now over in the adoption area, but uh, he was our planning section chief for quite a while. And he did, he did an amazing job. I normally don't take a planning section chief with me in the field. It happened to be him, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. But um, it was sure nice having somebody with that familiarity with planning and resource to be right there in the field and to be able to figure out how to use stuff that we wouldn't normally have access to. So we were able to get the keys to this truck and be able to use it because this was an area that you could not get to other than by helicopter or hiking all the way around. But the real reason that I brought Joel was because he was fit. He was a runner. And in our first two days, we hiked 21 miles over that rock. Tore up my boots so bad, I lost all the toes, all the toenails within about a week of being over there. My boots were trashed. I had to start wearing my running shoes uh, because it was the only thing that wasn't blistering my feet. It was just absolutely miserable. But we were worried about who we could bring to the scene uh, if they weren't fit, even within our own team. So when we put it out there, we say, okay, whoever's coming in next, beware that it's hot and you're doing a lot of hiking and you're a lot of carrying of a lot of stuff over some really treacherous area like this. So what would happen is that we would get picked up every morning at 745 by the helo. We would have all of our stuff ready to go. He would land because he was hot and he was getting paid by the hour. He would land, pick up all of our stuff in the net, pick us up, and take us to where we were going to work that day, drop us off, and pick us up that afternoon. And once we were there, we're on our own. So anything we had to take, we had to take with us, or we had to figure out how to, how to move things around. And once you were out there, you know, it was, it was a lot of work. And that's what we were hiking over. And so one day, we decided that we were going to hike in because we had the, the Hilo couldn't work with us that day. And so we hiked all the way around the ocean on that stuff. And this is the spot, you might not have remembered the story, but a guy died trying to get to a friend of his who had, he did not evacuate because he had a large marijuana grow. And he didn't want to leave it. And so his buddy was trying to bring him supplies. I'm sure he was getting paid well for getting there. But unfortunately, he got disoriented. Because once you got out there and you couldn't get your bearings, and it was so hot, they figured that he probably um, just got too hot and fainted. And they never found him. So that's the kind of stuff that we were dealing with. And you can see why it was important for you to be fit. And you can also see why planning was so important. Because once you got out there, you weren't coming back. You weren't saying, oh, could you bring me a bottle of water? And those water jugs were weighing 40, well, it's a, what, about 8 pounds per gallon. Uh, so a 5-gallon jug like that was 40 pounds, and you're lugging that stuff in. So it was tough work. But this is what we would find in these kapukas. Uh, kapuka is an area that's left from the lava flow and surrounding the areas. And we were finding these crazy guys everywhere. So what we would do is ask the, the helo operator to do a flyover of the area we were going to work that next day, spot any animals, take photos if he could, and then we at least have a starting point for when we got there. And we got pretty creative how we moved animals. And like I said, once you got there, you had nothing. Um, I found this wheelbarrow, and they all laughed at me. And I said, well, just keep laughing, because it's going to help us. Because once you got there, you had a lot of terrain to cover. And so this woman who asked us to go out and get her ducks, um, and about half of them were alive, uh, we had to then get them from her property to where the helicopter was going to pick us up. And that was the only thing I could find, so we got pretty clever. And it was cool until you had to go uphill with that dang thing. And then it was a beast pushing that thing, especially over rough terrain. Here's a picture of Joel and one of the animal control officers. Uh, for the first couple of days, we were hiking in and out. It was just gruesome. And we got pretty clever. That's a catch pole. We were rigging up ways that we could do several traps uh, with one load. And then once you got there, like I said, there was only one way out for these critters. Uh, you couldn't walk them out because they couldn't go over that. And many of the areas, it was too hot to go over anyway. So we had to figure out, well, how do you get in there? And how do you subdue them, capture them, subdue them, and then get them ready for a, a helicopter lift? So what we would do, and they're not easy to catch, by the way, 
Uh, fortunately, the Kapukas made it a little bit. But they would go up a little bit into the, to the lava rock, so it wasn't like you could control them completely. Uh, once we did wrestle them to the ground, then we would hogtie them and then blindfold them. And, but you had to time it perfectly for when the helicopter was coming. You didn't want that helicopter to wait because it's so expensive, but on the same hand, you couldn't go too early because they got heat stress. And we did not sedate. And this is what it looks like. We'll see if this works, I think. I hope it will. Not a very good photographer. So he would do that on all of our loads. So when we were ready, we would call him on the radio. Uh, we could take a couple of sheep, a couple of goats. Uh, we could take two big kennels at a load. So when it was time to go off that area, then he would come drop down. We'd get the loads in. He'd go over. We'd have another group at the trailer receiving the animals, putting them in the trailer. Real quickly, he, they'd come back at the second load. And then when we were all done, he'd come pick us up. We were always last, of course. And we got pretty clever on how to contain them. Uh, you know, the, the, these properties were not rehab rehabitable. And so um, we just stole some fencing material and, and made the area smaller and smaller and smaller so that we can contain them. It was absolutely critical. And matter of fact, the fire department uh, would not let us go out without our safety plan. And the safety plan it had to include a spotter. Uh, fortunately, we had uh, somebody from USGS that was a true animal lover, and she had all of the stuff. And being, um, you know, that's what she did for a living is studied vol volcanoes. So she was amazing to have, but she wasn't physically fit, so she couldn't make the walk in. Uh, so she would, we would position her in such a place where she had line of sight, radio comms, and then she carried the USGS radio, and we had a uh, fire radio as well. So when she saw that there was a change of wind or whatever, uh, we would either call the, the helo to get us out of there, or we'd beat feet and come back. So safety is huge. And you know, we have a tendency in the animal welfare world to think with our heart before we engage our brain. And so a lot of times we see an animal in distress, and the first thing we do is jump in, right? And, and when you're in this field, you just can't do that. You have to think it out and, and make sure that you're safe all the time. So we were wearing scrubbers. Um, you can see the monitor on my left um, strap. Uh, I think they were set at about two parts. And when that thing would chirp, the mask would come on. If it didn't chirp, you didn't have to wear it. Uh, we saw some pretty high readings. But keep in mind that you would have to be out working in that environment for eight hours unprotected for several days before it become toxic. So we were very safe. But we wanted to make sure that all of the animal welfare groups were following minimum standards and at least practicing their PPE. And this is what you were looking at every day. That sucker was right on your heels. And boy, you watched the wind to make sure that you were safe the whole time. Well, I got to share this with you. I poo-pawed this thing, and I almost nixed it initially. But uh, there was a group on Maui that were trapping feral pigs with a net system. I said, oh, man, we just don't have the time for that. And we were kind of slowing down. I said, sure, come on over. And they did. And this was the slickest thing I have ever seen. So this is about a 14-foot octagonal uh, frame that they pop together real quickly. It's all marked, so A goes into B and so forth. And the net goes in between them. So think of the best way to envision this is think about a fishing net that you use for trapping cats, right? You know how you get a cat in a net, and what's the first thing you do? You turn the handle, right? And that keeps them in the net part. So if you'll just remember that, it'll make sense to how this thing works. So the first thing is, once again, remember what I just said about feral cats. You have to have the in plan in mind so you don't trap something or you don't pick something up until you have a place to put it. So we built the corral first. And of course, you've got to have the helo. This is the owner, uh, Vietnam vet owner of the largest tour group on the Big Island. 
donated his bird to us for one full day to do this operation. Absolutely amazing man. Brought his wife and his son to be his crew for the fueling and whatnot. So this is the release line. So in its electronic latch, it's like a big magnet. When he is ready to release the net, he can do it inside the cabin. Uh, he never gets out. Nobody gets out to do in, that, that touches any animal that this thing drops over the top. That's the real key to this. Instead of being hot, people jumping out and trying to chase uh, critters around, you don't do any of that. Nobody gets out of the bird. And this is what it looks like when the, when the helicopter is lifting the cone of it. So just think of, again, once again, that fish net. And so what it has is a line that's attached to it so that when you release the line, the frame tilts. And it traps the animal in until it can get above ground, and then it brings them back like a fish in a net. So it sets down over the animal. The animal runs into the net, and they take off. And that's what it looks like when it's in the air. And this is what it looks like when it's bringing a cow back. Isn't that cool? And nobody has to get out. It's a little dicey when it comes back because <laughs> they're not necessarily happy. So you've got to make sure you've got the right handlers in there. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, you have a shoot and you put them on the trailer and we moved them. So it went extremely well. We're trying to get them to come over to the United States for the NASEP Summit and do a demo, or at least a discussion. So that was one of the highlights for the trip. And then, of course, once again, this whole reunification thing. And what made this one so special is anytime you do tech rescue, anytime you're doing something a little special, it makes the reunification even more special. Because these people had given up on these dogs and these animals because they didn't think anybody was going to be able to get into them. Uh, but fortunately, we got done eight straight days of Hilo Ops. Guess what he charged me? $1,500. $1,500. That was it. So he was obviously gifted because he was running that much in fuel probably almost daily, but it was pretty cool. Well, then let's start talking about the Mendocino complex fire. So we have Mentocino and Mendocino. So there are two counties in Northern California that are right next to each other, Mendocino County on the west and Lake County on the east. Uh, and we have been to both of them more times than I care to count for fires just like this. This turned out to merge into two fires. The two fires merged. They became a complex. And it burned over 435,000 acres. So it is now the largest fire in California state history. And it was a beast for sure. And once again, trying to find those groups where we can work together so well. And because we've been in this community or this county so many times, uh, it's seamless. We almost always, they almost always just give us animal search and rescue. Um, and we will pair up one of our people and one of their people and off we go. So it just works extremely well. There's trust there. They know that we're going to work for them and they're going and, and to work with us. And it just, it's just a fun place to go. What also makes this unique is Lynette, who is on the left side there, is married to a very high-ranking CAL FIRE person. Oftentimes, on a big fire, he'll be the IC for CAL FIRE. And he's married to this humaniac that is just crazy and wild and loves animals. And she started the CART program, the County Animal Response Team, that they call LEAPS in that county. So she started it. So we've got that link with CAL FIRE. So every day, she would go over to the morning briefing at the EOC and bring us the latest situational awareness. That is huge in this business. When you can see those fire lines exactly where they're at as of last night, that's really, really good for us. And she was bringing us radios that could communicate with CAL FIRE. Uh, so that was a really big bonus for us. So every morning, we would start with the briefing. She would come back over. Um, and then we would dispatch six teams a day, uh, and off they would go doing their thing. It was just amazing. You can see the size of that fire. I don't know if I can make that up, but that whole red area, uh, it's, just, it's kind of hard to match that. It was a big fire. And it took a lot of resources. And so here we are about ready to evacuate some horses that we couldn't get out on the first time through. So we were going back to get them a second time. And look at that fire. I mean, we were literally waiting for Cal Fire to say, yes, it's OK for you to go in now, but hurry. 
So we were staging up at that, and I'm looking at that fire and said, no, not quite yet. I'm not ready to go into that. Um, so it was, it was, it's scary stuff, but it's cool stuff, right? Are you excited? Do you want to go on a deployment? No. I think so. And notice that all of our folks, at least at this stage, uh, are wearing the proper PPE. Uh, if they're in that fire area, they've got complete PPE from top to bottom. Um, some of you for Relo notice this handsome guy. Um, his dad works for us. He used to work for us. Uh, it's probably one of the best son and dad teams you'll ever find. They get along, um, and they're both extremely talented. Uh, so like, I, like I've mentioned before, on fires, you'll see just about every species known to man. So a lot of birds and a lot of everything else. This is Sue Anderson, one of our responders, sharing her water bottle. Isn't that cool? They were obviously quite thirsty. Make sure that if you're going to do this work that you get the people that, are, that have those handling skills. Uh, don't put a cat person into a large animal role unless they've had that role before, unless they have an understanding of that. These big guys can, can do some serious damage to you, so be careful on your team selection. But we'll do a lot of this. This is just good old-fashioned feeding in place. Once we find out whether they're at, and whether the land can sustain them and they're out of harm's way, we feed them in place. I don't want to bring them back to the shelter. I mean, it's, it's easy when they're all in one spot, but it is a pain to try and find enough space. We would have had to go down to the fairgrounds and opened up the fairgrounds, and we just didn't want to do that. Plus, we know now when that guy comes home, his animals are going to be there. So it's better for us every two days or every three days. On most of the livestock, it was every other day because it was water issue and trying to get tenders into those areas that we could fill the big troughs. Right in about the middle of all of this, uh, we thought we were going to have to evacuate the evacuation shelter. And fortunately, we didn't. We did get a real scare on our other shelter. I had to race over. We left a trailer there all ready to go so they could stick their animals on the trailer in case the fire did break. They had a spot fire very, very close to the shelter, so we ran over there. By the time we got there, fire had knocked it down. But one night, we get these little alarms going off and saying the fire is wicked close. Be ready to evacuate. There was nobody in the area. and The whole town was uh, just us. So it was kind of cool anyway. It was a ghost town. Um, but at one point, we thought we were going to have to evacuate the shelter. So be careful where you think. I think that was Joe that mentioned you know, location, location, location. Think about where you're going to want to be. And some rescue is not quite technical. I think that cat probably would have climbed right up there to go home. Probably did, knowing him. But this is just a feeding in place. Uh, one of our responders that uh, love him to death, he does such a great job. And I just found out at lunch he's got a job. So he's not going to be working with us anymore. I had mentioned the PST. This is not a great view of it. But it's really important if you're going to be in this work, or whether you're even doing it at your county, Think about where you're going to stay. And we, I, you know, for us, if we go down to Louisiana, I can safely tell them we're completely self-sufficient. This particular unit uh, holds 14 people. Uh, there are six bunks on the back side, six bunks on the other side, uh, three showers and bathrooms, uh, complete sink area, washer and dryer, a couple of microwaves, a couple of refrigerators. IT has set up a hotspot. Uh, a dining area. So this is a really nice rig, completely donated, by the way. We didn't pay a dime for it, about $385,000. But we have used the begibis out of it. Everywhere we go, this thing is on the road, because most of the times we get to some place, and there are no hotels. For the campfire, folks were commuting every day an hour and 15 minutes. We were going across the street. So it's really important for, you, for us, anyway, to have those vehicles uh, that can sustain us. But even with this, we had three motorhomes. So we had three motorhomes in addition to this thing. And so th there's never enough, really. My command post, I don't want to call it my, but it is mine, is right on the, you can just bake out the front part of it. It's the black. So I have my own bunk, and we have all of our communication gear up there. But you know, one of the perks of being the IC is you do need time away. You need just kind of be able to go hide somewhere. Heidi, you can relate to that. 
you just so I designed that with that in mind, and nobody's given me any grief. Joel tried once, but <laughs> pretty much everybody just leaves me alone and lets me stay in my little area. Here's Joel again. Uh, this is typical for search and rescue kind of work. We're now down in Hurricane Florence. This is where Joe was saying Lumberton. Um, the town of Lumberton and the county was Robeson. Robeson County. Interestingly, we had been there two years ago, two years before, and it was not a great reception. Uh, public health did not like us. Uh, to be fair, we didn't handle the situation well. Uh, it was not a good shelter. The animals weren't being well cared for. We probably were a little too vocal. Um, we, we made some mistakes. Uh, but it was a crappy shelter. This time around, they warmly embraced us. The same, the shelter director and the public health person was, were still there, but they saw the job we had done the year before and we had won their trust. And they pretty much gave the keys to Joe and said, make it work. And he did. And that's the beauty of having really good people, right? When you bring good people to the, to the field, you win over their trust. And not only will you have a nice operation that time, but you're going to have even a better operation the next time. And you know, everybody thinks, as I mentioned earlier, that, that the water work is, it is sexy work, but it is beastly, when, especially because the water levels change on you all the time. You'll be in 12 feet of water one minute, and the next one you're, you're you know, sloshing your boots around. Uh, and so it's, it's really not as fun as it looks. And what are those couple of birds in there, I think, right? like maybe two or three ducks, knowing Joel. Interestingly, um, so as I mentioned, we were there two years before. Joel, we had to kind of split up our operation, and I left Joel in Lumberton. And he went back to the same house we had been to two years before, found the same kennel with a dog in the kennel with his head about like this above the water. So same house, same kennel, same situation, different dogs. I mean, why that guy hasn't been arrested is beyond me. That's kind of the tough part of our job. So what happened in this particular operation is we had so many requests uh, that we had six boats in the water, and we split up into three teams. Joel took Lumberton, I went down south, and Kyle went over to Florence. And it stretched us. It made me a little bit nervous, but it went extremely well. So we were able to service three different communities at the same time. So here's Joel and his dang birds. I don't know what he's got about birds. Um, this is his partner in crime uh, out of our LA office. And yeah, it was just great work. Everybody always asks me, I, one time we rescued a duck in a flood. They said, why are you rescuing a duck in a flood? <laughs> And then you get Kyle. Kyle gets all the good calls. Here's a dog all packaged up, ready to go. <laughs> Probably in there licking the barbecue racks, right? <laughs> well, I, Karen Walsh is right up here. Wave your hand. So Karen oversees our reload program. And I tell you, uh, we kind of changed the way we operate a couple of years ago now, where when we go to disaster mode, when she can kind of move her vehicles around from what they were doing to support us, it makes such a big difference. So I'm talking about the lily pads. Where she's got these sprinter vans that are amazing, and they work perfectly for that lily pad operation. And I think I've got a better picture of what the inside looks like here. So what we would do is if we were coming out of the water, and you got three or four do dogs or whatever, in an hour and 15 minutes to get back to the shelter. Instead, they were there. They could shuttle, and that team could get right back in the water. So it worked extremely well. So bringing the two programs together during a disaster, it, it's good on my end anyway. Uh, I'm sure, certainly glad that we have it. These are amazing rigs. We're actually going to put one on our budget this year just for fun because they're so nice. And once again, you get into those situations when you're doing water rescue work where sometimes you're in the water and then sometimes you've got to get out or sometimes you've got to face a dog. You know, as you're reading that body language, what are you thinking? You don't really know, do you? And so you want to make sure that you may have a really good SAR tech, uh, a search and rescue person that's got great slack water rescue skills, but maybe not the animal handling skills. So there has to be the balance. And they've got to be able to read that body language and say yay or nay. 
so just be aware of that. If you're going to start getting into this and you, you want to kind of find what your niche is, and just keep in mind that you want to have that balance. So we're right now starting to teach the USAR folks um, how to read um, body language, understand a little bit of that behavior, capture, control, and handle. Uh, we just rolled our class, first class out two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago in New York, up here. So with that curriculum, we're just kind of getting it going, and, and hopefully we'll get a lot more folks taking that so that you can get these good SAR, SAR tech people but still know how to handle an animal. These were a couple of my pigs. Um, it's a cute story. Uh, the water was coming up seven inches an hour. Seven inches an hour. So this much every hour. And they had more eight more hours they thought that it would continue to go up. So one of the farmers called us and said, can you get back? And sure, no problem. We put the boat in, and about three hours later, we got to the property. It was a beast getting back there. And then when we get back there, this is what we see, and we know that the water's going to come up another. At that time, I think we were figuring 14 inches. What do you do with pigs like that? There's no place to put them. You, you put one in your boat, and you're all out of the wa in the water, right? Um, if you could even figure out how to put them in your boat. So we... What's that Marine? What did the Marines say? Adapt and overcome. Somehow, magically, the door to the house opened up. And so what I did is I found a bunch of plywood, and I made a chute that went through the kitchen. He had just laid beautiful linoleum. <laughs> in through the living room, through the dining room, and out to this area on the deck. And we just shot them through. There were six of them. Ran them right out to that sun deck, laid their food down on there, and they were happy because they weren't treading water anymore. They were out of the water. The owner's not going to care. I mean, he probably, we tried to kind of wipe up the floor a little bit, but he's not going to care. He saved his pigs. So, and we measured out there, and we had enough, gunnel, or enough uh, height that, we, that they'd be just fine. So you've got to be creative. You've got to think out of the box. You've got to think about what's going to make it work. Pigs are always tough, and they're good swimmers for a while. And then we get into Hurricane Michael. Um, they were, this was like in October now. Uh, I missed the tail end of Michael because I was going to Ethiopia, doggone it. Uh, but I was on the front end of it. Um, but it was an interesting one. So we went from Florence, which was all water-based, to Michael that was all land-based. So kind of a little change in expertise, change in the skill sets that you're looking for, et cetera. Same level of destruction. And you know, now you're scurrying through structures. You're climbing over stuff. You've got a whole bunch of different hazards that you have to be aware of in a different level set of training. Now, fortunately, our core team, two, three years ago, uh, went through some basic awareness and operational level for confined, confined space and trench rescue. So most of the folks that are the core team have got at least a modicum of understanding on how to stay out of trouble. But you've got to be careful with your group because they're going to go right into these kind of structures without even thinking about the safety part of it. And then trying to find an animal in all of that overgrowth and you know trash and debris and detritus that's just laying around is... It takes a, a lot of talent, for sure. And then you're walking on top of this rubble that you could fall through. There's nails in that. There's just so many hazards in that structure. Um, and it was interesting when we debriefed from this, um, they all said, let's go take more of that training, because it was good to know by looking at what it, you know, was that structurally sound and what house you're going to stay out of. Uh, during Sandy, we, we were doing... Um, uh, the shelter was giving us daily requests. And one woman on the request sheet just gave us the front page of the newspaper, and she circled her house. And the house had gotten off the foundation and was 100 yards down the shore. And she had put nine cats. So there were nine cats in the house off the foundation and wanted us to go rescue them. So we checked in at the roadblock. I checked in with the IC. We went and did a, a quick assessment. And I said, no, we're not going in. And, you know, the team is like this, because they wanted to go get those cats. And I went back to the IC, and I said, no, it's not safe for us to go. And he said, that was the right answer. You guys are welcome back every day. We want to work with you, because you understand the importance of not going into places you shouldn't be. So it will pay off for you. 
It'll be hard. It'll wrench at your heart. Uh, but it'll, it'll pay dividends down the road. So just be aware of what that really will mean in terms of putting your people at risk. And every time we do a fire, we do a, you know, there's all these gall dang petting zoos and exotic places, and they're everywhere. Uh, during the fire in um, Wolseley Fire, everybody wanted to know, I think they called him Charlie. How is Charlie the giraffe doing? So we had to make a special trip to make sure Charlie was doing okay. And the same situation down in Michael because they become a real popular animal for the community. And then, of course, you have to have your cute situations where mama and all the puppies show up safe and sound. And then, of course, from the medical side, uh, this is where our triage is critical and why setting up some place that we can bring these animals at. And we prefer to do that outside the shelter. Uh, in um, Arkansas, we set up an area on the back end, so we completely separated. So as the animals were coming in from the field, they were deconned, they were triaged, deconned, and then they were brought into the isolated area. Uh, and then the vehicles were deconned and they could go back out again. And we did not let that population come into the general population for a minimum of two to three days. And as it turned out, we had enough room, they never came into our population. So it's really critical that you have this set up in a strategic spot. And a lot of it's going to depend upon what the weather's like. Talking about fitness again, uh, this gets old quick, wouldn't it? Especially if you've got a 50, 60 pound dog inside that crate. So if you haven't thought about getting a fitness program going, here's your wake up call. Just more of the same. Boy, that, I don't think people appreciate just how much destruction occurred during Michael. Well, then I want to get into my favorite, and it's the last one, um, and that's the campfire. For those of you who do not, did not, well, maybe we were out of the country, that's about the only way you could have missed this one. Uh, the most destructive fire, all of these most, biggest, most whatever in California recently, but um, this was the most destructive fire in California history. And it went through a little town called Paradise. And not too far from where I was living at the, t at the just before that, and I'd been up looking at property in there, and the reason I didn't want to go there was there was only one way in and one way out. And that's what happened. This fire came so quickly, uh, it was first spotted by a team at 6.30 in the morning. By 8.30, it was in paradise. It was just literally flying through. And it consumed that town so quickly that people couldn't get out. I mean, what would you do if you were in these cars right there? Well, what happened is people weren't moving fast enough, so what did they do? They bailed. And then what happened to that car? Now, it's plugging up everybody behind them. And so it was a mess. It was just truly, truly a mess. And just, you know, people would say, well, that's as far as I could get. I'll tie them up here, and hopefully somebody can take care of them. So I want to talk about this group just a little bit. This is called Cowboys 911. Have you heard of that group? They're a little bit like um, the Cajun Navy. They saved a lot of lives. And had they not been there, uh, I don't think they would have, I don't think the group, local groups would have been able to handle the calls that were coming in. At one point, they handled over 1,000 calls in one day. That's how many came in for requests for assistance, 1,000. You know, a normal day, you might get 20 to 30, 1,000 requests. So had Cowboys 911 not shown up, they probably wouldn't have gotten to them as quickly as they did. The problem is that they had no concept of ICS. They didn't understand the importance of working underneath a command structure. They were willing to do the work. They were pretty good at the work. They certainly knew how to handle large animals. But they were, uh, they were just difficult to work with. And so the local group, the local cart, was keeping them out, keeping them out. And then there was so much of a community uproar that the sheriff said, screw it, come on in. And then the cart that had spent so many years developing these standards of having the proper training were now confronted with all of these vehicles that had no training and no gear. I mean, they were dressed like you guys are right now, going into fire. Uh, so it was a really difficult situation. So what do you do about that? We don't want to lose that talent. We certainly don't want to lose those trailers and trucks and these handlers. Yes, ma'am? Um, I'm just curious. You've got a lot of people that want to come in and help. And like you said, it's really important to have the structure. And the ASPCA is a big, you know, head group for that. When people do that, have you guys in the past 
like collaborated with them so that in the future they can be part of the ASPCA and then better help instead of just kind of coming in like you said and you know ramrodding and helping but it's chaos. Did you guys all hear the question? You project well, by the way. Um, yeah, it's a great question. At the time, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not very good at it at that time because we all have jobs to do. But since that time, we have reached out to them, not me personally, but the county, and just said, can we at least invite you to come in and do some of the training so you understand how we do business? And so I think for next time, it will be better. And then they've got to go through the curriculum that the CART has set up. But I have a tendency to be, um, I'm not as good at that as I should be. I get kind of into my mode. You know, you can get a lot more people in that, you know, will learn what you want them to know. And then when the time comes, like you said, they come together and then everybody's got the training you want. Right, right. Um, yeah, and the key is, you know, and, and I guess the reason that I'm not as good as I should be is that I've been burned so many times by these groups. And let me give you a real quick example. In Hurricane Florence, uh, we got there and there was a rogue group that had come from Texas that were saving animals. They were literally saving animals and doing a good job. But they had come into emergency management and lied about their credentials. So they're offloading dogs and Joel looks in their boat and here's an AK-47 sliding back and forth. So do you want those people in your community? Uh, so then, during Michael, they showed up again. Uh, the folks got on the call and said, this group is here again, and the state of Florida escorted them out of the state. So if they're willing to work with us like this group, and they were in Nebraska, am I getting close? That can't be right. <laughs> really? Well, I am. I... <laughs> Sit down. I'm, you're making me nervous. <laughs> I am almost done. It's your fault. <laughs> Great partners. Anybody here from Oregon? Love these guys. Are you with Oregon Humane? Oh my God, just love them. I'll, I'll take them anywhere, anytime. Um, we actually got a mission assignment for National Guard. That's only happened to me twice, I think. Uh, they were doing feeding in place for the large animal, and they were coming over and walking the dogs when they had free time. And I had to show this slide. What is her name? Green? Ashley Green, I'd never heard of her. Zombie movies? Anybody heard of her? What is it? Twilight. Oh, Twilight. Well, I think she's like famous though, right? I mean, does she have a pretty big following? I'd never heard of her. But, um, and I didn't want a celebrity coming in. But there is a value to letting a celebrity come in, come in right? And so the PIOs from the two groups, the um, uh, public information officers talked about it and said, in this case, it's probably not going to, and she was awesome. She put one of our t-shirts on, which was kind of cool, did a PSA for us. Uh, so I'm just kind of giving you that out there, that be aware that sometimes bringing a celebrity in can be counterproductive. But she just worked fine. What's that? She worked. Yeah, she worked hard. Uh, we've already talked about Ella and her dog. Uh, doing all this cool. How you guys can put a line in on a bird like that is amazing to me. You're, you're just amazing folks. All the wounds that we talked about already. But I want to finish with the story of this young lady, <laughs> Lindsay. Um, this was a young lady that came in and was in our reception tent. So as people would come in to try and find their animals, they would stop at her tent. So there were some times where she would be able to say, yes, we've got them, and she's on this high, this roller coaster that you were talking about. And then other times, I can't find them. And they said, well, what are you guys doing here? You know, and she'd have to take the grief. And every day, she was on this emo emotional roller coaster. And we kept taking her aside and saying, can we move you? Can we put you in a different job? She said, no, I think I've got it. And she would come back just emotionally spent. And every day, she would get back up. She, every morning at 7 o'clock, she'd have a smile on her face, and she would go back and do the same job again. Now, we were watching her very, very closely to make sure that she wasn't you know, getting too far into this cycle. Uh, but you need to be aware of it, but you also need a 1,000 of those. Uh, just an amazing, amazing person that did a great job for us, and I'm pretty sure that's my last one.